Thank you. God bless you. Rick said he uh, wanted to have the brightest minds in the country for the conference. He invited them, and they couldn't come. And uh, so here I am. Actually, one of my students came to me some time ago, and he said, Dr. Geisler, we think you're smarter than Einstein. So I commended him for his insight. And he said, no, that's not what I mean. What I mean is there are only three people in the world who could understand what Einstein was saying, and nobody can understand what you're saying. So I'll try. I will uh, try and make this uh, uh, short and sweet and right to the point. My topic for today is uh, if God, why evil? If God, why evil? If God, why the Holocaust? If God, why 9-11? If God exists, why Virginia Tech and 207? There are three basic responses to the problem of evil. The pantheist, all is God and God is all. Mary Baker Patterson Gloveretti, she had several husbands, uh, affirmed that God uh, exists but evil doesn't. Atheist affirmed that evil exists and God doesn't. Theist, which is what we are, belief in one God, believe both God and evil. Now that's a problem. In fact, it's a problem for all of the views. Uh, how do we explain an absolutely perfect God and the existence of evil? Well, pantheist explanation is unrealistic. In Science and Health with Key, the scripture, Mary Baker Eddy said, God is all Therefore, all that really exists is in and of God. Evil is but an illusion and has no real basis. Now, the poet put it this way. There was a pantheist of Deal who said that though pain is not real, yet when I sit upon a pin and it punctuates my skin, I dislike what I fancy I feel. <laughs> the problem with pantheism is it's not very realistic. Uh, if evil is not real, then why does it seem so real? Why does death and sickness and cancer and hatred feel so real? Where did the illusion come from? Why is it that everyone seems to have the same illusion? And why can't we make it go away if it's just an illusion? As a matter of fact, pantheism is unrealistic. Atheism is ungrounded. C.S. Lewis was an atheist, and he said, my argument was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? Man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. Of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed. There's no grounds for atheism because his statement that the world is not just demands that he knows what's just. But if there's a moral law that says be just, there must be a moral law giver. Pantheism is unrealistic. Atheism is ungrounded. Evil cries out for God. It cries out for God in three ways. First of all, to explain how we know it's evil. Ravi Zacharias has a very effective way of saying this when he gets a, a relativist in his uh, group. He'll say to him, let me ask you this. Is there anything wrong anywhere? Because if there's anything wrong anywhere, then there must be some standard of right. If there's some moral prescription, then there must be a moral prescriber. So rather than crying out against God, evil cries out for God. Secondly, who's going to comfort you? Even Nietzsche bemoaned the fact. Nietzsche was the one you remember said, God is dead, sign Nietzsche. And an invisible hand wrote under it, Nietzsche is dead, sign God. Remember him? <laughs> He said, I don't have anyone to comfort me. Spinoza does, the others who believe in God. There's no one to comfort me. The time that you're in evil and suffering is not the time to cry out against God. It's the time to cry out for God. Read the Psalms. And who's going to give the victory over evil? Who's going to make it possible for us to overcome the evil? Rather than cry out against God, evil cries out for God in three ways to explain how we know it's evil, to comfort us in our sorrow over evil, and to give us victory over evil. Now here's the problem of evil for believers. We believe that God is all good and opposes evil. 
We believe that God is all-knowing, and he foreknew that evil was going to happen. Adam and Eve didn't catch him by surprise. Someone said it wasn't the apple on the tree. It was the pear on the ground that got us in trouble. Well, God, God knew that they were going to do that. Uh, he knew before it happened. He's all-knowing. God is all-powerful. He can defeat evil. Now, if you have an all-good, all-knowing, and all-powerful God, then why does he permit evil? That's the problem for the Christian. In fact, there are many problems of evil. First of all, the problem of the nature of evil. If God created all things and evil is something, then it would appear as though God created evil. Now, we can't say God didn't create all things. That would be giving up our theism and some form of dualism that evil is there forever. We can't say evil isn't real because then we'd end up with pantheism. But it looks like if God created all things and evil is something, therefore God must have created evil. The response to this was given by St. Augustine around 400 AD in his book, The Anti-Manichaean Writings. He said, evil is not a thing. Evil is a corruption of a good thing. God made only good things. Evil is a corruption of the good things that God has made. Evil is like rot to a tree. You never have something that's totally rotten. Uh, totally rotten tree is topsoil, you know. Uh, totally rotten tree doesn't exist. You have to have a tree uh, for rot to exist in it. Evil is like rust to a car. You never have a totally rusted car. For a totally rusted, it'd be a brown spot on the pavement, you know. Uh, you have to have iron to have rust in it. Evil is like uh, moth holes in a cloth. You have to have a cloth there that have holes in it. God made the good thing. Evil corrupted the good thing. You can't have a totally moth-eaten garment. What would that be? That'd be a hanger in your closet. <laughs> the problem of evil for theism, the response is this. God created only good things. Evil is not a thing, so God did not create evil. That doesn't mean evil isn't real. It's real. It's a real lack. Blindness is a real lack of sight. If you don't think it's real, then just put a blindfold on, try and walk around for a day. It's a real handicap. It's a real lack. It's a real privation. Evil is real, but it's not a real thing. We say, well, where did the, the holes in the garment come from and the rust in the car and the rot in the tree? Where, where did evil come from? If God made only good things and evil is a privation in good things, where did the evil come from? And the answer to that uh, is that God is absolutely perfect. God cannot create anything imperfect. And a perfect creature cannot do evil. If God created a perfect creature, they wouldn't be able to do something that was imperfect. Therefore, evil cannot arise in such a world. Now, that creates a serious problem for us. Because we can't deny the first premise, God is absolutely perfect. We can't deny the second one, that God cannot create anything imperfect. And how can a perfect creature do something imperfect? St. Augustine in the fourth century uh, wrote several books on this. And uh, his answer uh, was very much to the point. The response, God is absolutely perfect, no doubt. God cannot create anything imperfect, absolutely true. A perfect creature cannot do evil is false. A perfect creature can do evil because if a perfect creature is given certain perfections, evil is made possible. So let me illustrate it. How a perfect creature can do evil. Now in biblical terms we're talking about Lucifer, the archangel, uh, and then later Adam. Lucifer is a perfect creature, no evil in his environment, no tempter. Uh, God created good things. Well, he created one good thing that's called free will. And he gave Lucifer free choice. He gave Adam free choice. Now it's good to be free. Did you ever see anybody march back to bondage, down with freedom? I want to do everything my mother ever told me. I mean, nobody ever marches like that, right? We march for freedom. And even if somebody did march against freedom, he'd be freely doing it. So uh, it would be self contradictory. So one good thing that God created was free will. Free will makes evil possible, since it's the power to do otherwise. 
If you're free to love God, you're also free to hate him. If you're free to praise God, you're also free to blaspheme him. Freedom is the ability to do otherwise. To do otherwise than good is evil. Hence, a perfect creature can do evil. There is no way that God can make uh, a free creature that can't do evil because freedom means the ability to do otherwise. Oh, he could make a robot, but they're not free to love. Oh, he can make an automaton, but they're not free to praise. God could make uh, a puppet, but they're not free to enter into interpersonal relationships. A perfect creature that has free will can do evil. So God made evil possible by giving us a good thing called free will. We make evil actual by misusing the good thing that he gave us. Henry Ford mass produced a car. He made a lot of evil possible. Every time you go on the road, uh, that evil is possible. But he's not responsible for every accident. He's not responsible for everyone who misuses the automobile. Problem one, how can one will evil when there is no evil to will? I mean, Lucifer didn't have an evil nature. He didn't have an evil environment. There was no tempter there. There was an absolutely perfect God, an absolutely perfect environment. How can one do evil when there is no evil to will? Response, evil arose when a good creature, Lucifer, with a good power of free will, will the finite good of the creature over the infinite good of the creator. Evil doesn't have to have good out there in order for it to occur. One can create evil. No evil needs to exist in order to will evil. Willing a lesser good can be an evil. And Lucifer willed the lesser good of himself over the greater good of God and brought evil into this universe. You say, well, then why didn't God stomp it out? Why didn't he just nip it in the bud right there? That leads us to the third question, the persistence of evil. Here's the problem. If uh, God is all good, he would defeat evil. If God is all powerful, he could defeat evil. But evil is not defeated. Just look around. Look at the TV, look at the newspaper, look in the mirror. Evil is not <laughs> defeated. Therefore, no such God exists. Now, this is probably the most powerful argument atheists have ever devised. This one argument has led to more skepticism, atheism, and agnosticism than anything I know of. If God is all good, he could, uh, he would defeat evil. If he's all powerful, he could. Evil is not defeated. Therefore, there is no such God. How do we respond? Well, we agree with the first premise. If he's all good, he would defeat evil. And we agree with the second premise. If God is all powerful, he could defeat evil. We disagree with the third one because they forgot one word. Yet. Evil is not yet defeated. Therefore, it doesn't follow that evil will never be defeated. It might be defeated later this afternoon or tomorrow or next week. The fact that evil isn't yet defeated doesn't prove that it won't be. For example, the fact that I'm in the middle of a sentence doesn't mean that I'm not going to finish it. Or you're in the middle of a novel doesn't mean it's never going to have a proper ending. Wait and see. Therefore, no such God exists does not follow. Note, this conclusion does not follow since evil might yet be defeated in the future. So the atheist argument, his best argument, collapses because he forgot the word yet. Now, atheists are clever, and so they sometimes say this. If God's all good, he would defeat evil. If he's all powerful, he could. Evil never will be defeated. Therefore, there is no such God. Good argument. Problem, premise number three, or C, that evil never will be defeated. There's no way that anyone could know that unless he were God. Because how do you know? You'd have to be omniscient. You'd have to know all future states of affairs to know that evil never will be defeated. So in order for the atheist to defeat God, he'd have to be God, uh, which uh, is self-destructive. There's no way for the objector to know this unless he is God, namely an all-knowing being. The persistence of evil, I think, 
is the most uh, important question that we can face here, and the most important answer we can give to it is look carefully again at the very premises. We agree that if God is all good, he would. We agree if he's all powerful, he could defeat evil. We agree that evil is not yet defeated, but what follows rationally from those three premises is this. Therefore, evil one day will be defeated. How do I know? The nature of a theistic God, the nature of the God of the Bible guarantees it because he's all powerful and can do it. And he's all good and wants to do it. So hang on, it's coming. He will do it. And the proof that he will do it is the very nature of the God that they're attacking, the God of the Bible, an all-powerful and all-good God. Well, how can God defeat evil? How can he possibly do it? Well, he allows everyone to freely choose their destiny, so freedom is preserved. He doesn't have to make robots, uh, automatons, puppets. He allows everyone to be free, and they choose which way they want to go, so freedom is preserved. Then he defeats evil by one, someday separating good from evil. You know what bothers good people? Evil. You know what bothers evil people? Good. I used to work on the assembly line in Detroit when I was growing up. And I can tell you right there, they're just good and evil people. There's nobody in between. You know what bothered me? The evil people, swearing, cursing, telling filthy stories, blowing their smoke in my face. You know what bothered them? Me reading my Bible, witnessing, passing out tracts. There's a solution to that. In eternity, there's going to be a smoking section and a non-smoking section. <laughs> you can guess which is which. And no one's going to be able to blow smoke in your face, and they're going to be able to smoke as long as they want to, <laughs> separating evil from good forever. The Bible says that in terms of the sheep and the goats, the good fish and the bad fish, separating good from evil. By quarantining evil forever. You know what we do with contagious diseases? We quarantine the people. You know what we do with people who are uh, violent uh, criminals? We quarantine them from society. We put them in a separate place. There has to be a hell or there's no solution to the problem of evil. Because as long as somebody wants to do evil, and as long as this evil disrupts good people, then there has to be a place where it's separated. Now think of it. Heaven is a place where there'd be no more evil to frustrate good people. Nobody swearing, nobody cursing, nobody doing anything evil to me, praising God forever. Hell is a place where there's no more good to frustrate evil people, where the hound of heaven stops barking, and where when the last scroll of time is rolled up and the last candle uh, is extinguished, people will forever be in exactly the place they want to be. By punishing evil and rewarding good. If there's no reward for good and no punishment for evil, then the solution to the problem has not occurred. God will defeat evil by defeating death and Satan. What is the great evil? The great and last evil is death has to be defeated or there's no solution. It's called the resurrection. The devil is always going to be around unless he is separated from us forever and banished from the presence of God so there's no more temptation. You will never be able to say, the devil made me do it. Now, according to the Bible, this was officially done when Christ came the first time. And according to the Bible, this is going to be actually accomplished when Christ comes the second time. Let's look at the official defeat of evil. Colossians 2, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having despoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. His blood is washed white as snow. He officially defeated evil on the cross. For as much then as the children are partakers, Hebrews 2, of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. 
the devil was officially defeated. He was declawed and defanged at the cross. He's got a bark but no bite because Jesus took the bite away from it. Now when's it going to actually happen? At the second coming, Revelation 19. I saw heaven open, behold a white horse, uh, and he that sat upon it was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. The armies of which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. And Revelation 21 says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. In the first heaven, the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. Yes, evil has already been defeated officially at the cross. It will be defeated uh, actually at the second coming. How do we know there's going to be second coming? There were almost 100 predictions in the Old Testament about the first coming, and they were all literally fulfilled what city he would be born in, when he would die, how he would die, how he would be born, how he would suffer, all there. Now if 100% of the predictions about his first coming were fulfilled, you can bet on it. The 100% of the ones on the second coming will be fulfilled as well. And what will Jesus say when we see him? I never said it would be easy. I only said it would be worth it. Yeah, evil is tough. Suffering is tough, but it's going to be worth it all, which leads us to our last question, the purpose of evil. Why did God permit evil? The problem is this, in all good, God must have a good purpose for everything, but there is no good purpose for some suffering, useless or innocent suffering. What's the purpose for a little child getting cancer? Hence, there cannot be an all good God. That's a very painful, pun intended, uh, problem. Because if God is all good, he has to have a good purpose for everything, but we all know things for which there's no good purpose. Hence, there cannot be an all good God. There is either a finite God, doesn't have enough power to do it, or no God at all. Response, just because we don't know a good purpose for evil doesn't mean there isn't none. See, the atheist assumes that because we don't know something, no one could know it. Well, the problem is, if God is all-knowing, he knows it. And if the atheist doesn't know it, that doesn't prove God is dead. It just proves he's dumb. <laughs> and doesn't know what the answer is. Just because we don't know a good purpose for evil doesn't mean there is none. And all good, all-knowing God knows a good purpose for everything. Some evil seems to us to have no good purpose, but an all good God has a good purpose for everything, even what seems to us not to have a good purpose. So even evil has a good purpose. I just don't always know what it is. We do not know all things. We don't know the end of all things, but God does. He knows the end of all things, and he knows all things. And there are a couple of verses to tuck away in your memory here. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but to us and to our children, the things that are revealed. I don't know why some things happen to me, and I don't know why some things happen to you, but I know why I don't know why. <laughs> because I'm finite because I'm a little microbe on a speck of cosmic dust off in the far-flung corner of the universe, and God is all-knowing. Now, who do you think is going to know the answer to the problem? Secret things belong unto the Lord our God. Romans 11:33. His ways are unsearchable, and his judgments are past finding out. Yes, there is a purpose for evil. No, I don't always know what that purpose is, but I know that an all-good God has a good purpose and does know it and will bring good out of evil. Paul Harvey became famous for what was known as the rest of the story. He went to visit a young man whose life was being nipped into bud by cancer. 
He went to encourage him, and he came away encouraged himself because a young man looked up at Paul Harvey and said, I do not believe that the divine architect of the universe ever builds a staircase that leads to nowhere. And I do not believe that the God whose purpose is revealed in nature, whose purpose is revealed in creation, whose purpose is revealed in scripture, I do not believe that the divine architect of the universe has staircases that lead to nowhere. You may think they aren't going anywhere because you don't see very far and you don't see very much. But God sees as far as can be seen, the end from the beginning, Isaiah 46, 10, and he knows all things. The divine architect of the universe has a good plan. What we know about suffering, God hasn't left us in the dark. We do know some purposes for some evil. Some pain has a good purpose. For example, warning pains. If you get a toothache, it's got a good purpose. You better go to the dentist or you're going to be feeling down in the mouth. Uh, <laughs> glad some of you got that. It's a little early. I know. <laughs> Another good pain, a pain in the chest. You get a sharp pain in your chest, you better go to the doctor. It may be a heart attack. Another good pain, pain in the lower right side. You get an acute pain there, your appendix may have burst. There are a lot of good pains. They're called warning pains. Secondly, we know from experience that we learn more through pain than we do through pleasure. I take this survey all over the country. How many of you have learned an enduring lesson in life through pleasure? Raise your hand. Not many. I didn't see any. How many of you have learned an enduring lesson in life through pain? Raise your hand. Lots of hands. Well, now, there's the point. Why does God permit pain? C.S. Lewis, in his book on the problem of pain, says it beautifully. God whispers to us in our pleasure, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It's God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God will not tie a rope around the donkey's head and bring him screaming and kicking in the kingdom against his will because God works only persuasively, not coercively. But God will knock the donkey on the head with a two-by-four. Some of you know that. The ones that are laughing all know that. Uh, put some images here. God whispers in our pleasure. You're lying on the beach and the uh, breeze is blowing through the palms. And you say, it's great to be alive. God whispers in our pleasure. You're speeding down the highway, 75 in the 55 zone. You see a red light in the mirror, and you feel a knot in your stomach. It's called conscience. God's speaking a little louder. You're lying in the hospital, dying. You wound up like a mummy, and God's shouting to you in your pain. I know I've been there. I was lying in the hospital, dying of hepatitis. The guy next to me is dying of a heart attack. The radio comes on, and a senator died of hepatitis. Believe me. God was speaking to me through pain. I had all my sins confessed. I was ready to go. Why? Because pain is God's megaphone to arouse a morally deaf world. Joseph said to his brothers who left him for dead, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is being done, namely the saving of many lives. It may happen from an evil person, but God has a good purpose for it. Because our disappointments are often God's appointments. And what someone else did to you by intentionally harming you, God was doing something in you to intentionally help you. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness, Hebrews 12:11. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. If you suffered pain from birth to death for 70 years, how much is that in the light of eternity? It's not even a pinch. Our momentary troubles are yielding for us an eternal weight of glory. Someone put it this way. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know. Why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so? Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think that it must be 
that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. I was sent that poem while I was dying of uh, hepatitis, and I memorized it on the spot, and God has graciously allowed me to pass it on. This is not the best of all possible worlds. Voltaire was right in his book, Candide, but it may be the best way to the best world. Evil has to be permitted to be defeated. You can't defeat the champion unless you get in the ring with him. God had to permit evil to destroy evil. Permitting evil is necessary to produce higher goods. No courage without danger. You can't produce patience without tribulation. My buddy said, uh, Norm, you need to pray for patience in my early Christian life. I did, one day. I had three flat tires and the transmission fell out of the car that day. <laughs> It's the last time I prayed for patience. You see, you don't get patience without tribulation. No character without adversity, no pain, no gain. God permits evil to produce a greater good. No forgiveness without sin. To whom much is forgiven, much is appreciated. The best way to the best world. This is not the best world possible, but God is the best being possible. Now the best being possible must accomplish the best end possible. But this world is the best way to the best end. Therefore, making this world was the best way to achieve the best world possible. God knew that we would never get to the promised land without first going through the wilderness. God knew that Christians would be like tea. Their real strength comes out when they get in hot water. Uh, and God gives us the hot water. God knew that you can't get the imperfections to the surface unless you put the heat on the gold and the imperfections surface. And the heat of this world and the heat of suffering and pain is what makes the imperfections surface. This is the best that free creatures be free to choose their own destiny. God can't force free creatures to choose heaven. That's a contradiction in terms. C.S. Lewis saw this very clearly. This is why everyone won't be in heaven. When one says, all will be saved, my reason retorts, without their will or with it. If I say without their will, I at once perceive a contradiction. How can the supreme voluntary act of self-surrender be involuntary? If I say with their will, my reason replies, how? If they will not give in. You see, God is love, and love always works persuasively, never coercively. Forced love is a contradiction in terms. And the reason there's a hell is not simply that God is just and must punish evil, but because he's so loving he won't force people against their will. Now my wife said, honey, be sure and tell them that one illustration because it means so much to her. And being a good husband, always obeying my wife, I'm going to now tell you what she told me to tell you. If you can't stand being in church for one hour praising God and loving Jesus, how would you feel if you had to go to church forever? It would be hell, right? He heaven would be hell for an unbeliever who doesn't love Jesus, whose heart's not changed, who didn't respond to his grace. You can't force people into heaven. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. If you're not a believer, God loves you. Christ died for you. He rose from the uh, dead, and he wants you to be part of his family, but you know what? He can't force you into the fold. It's contrary to his very nature to force his love upon you. C.S. Lewis put it this way in his great book on hell. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. There are only two kinds of people in this room. Those who have said, thy will be done, O God. And those who, if they don't change their mind, someday God will say to them, have it your way. Thy will be done. Milton in Paradise Lost puts in the mouth of Satan these words. 
Better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. And I added God's word. You've got it. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I pray that there be nobody here who will ever say that better to reign in hell than serve in heaven.